All right, welcome back to my uh, Martin Luther King um, assassination video number two. It is now 18 September, and at first we're going to go into this speech. It may take a couple of videos to get through all of it because it's almost an hour. Um, this is one of Martin Luther King's, one of his best speeches um, in a morality sense, I guess you could say. Uh, but it's also the speech that I think got him killed. This speech was done at a church, I think, in California, uh, somewhere in the fall of 1967, where he finally comes out against the Vietnam War. And uh, one of the main reasons is because the, um, the effect of the draft on the African-American population was much more extreme than the rest the rest of the country uh, even though African Americans only made up 10 15 percent of the population they were 30 percent of the military draftees sent to Vietnam so because you know a lot of white people were able to afford college and go to college and get uh, draft exemptions so the burden of this unjust war that started after the assassination of Martin Luther King was being felt on the African American population and so another reason is because here we were sending 30% of the military was African American to go fight in Vietnam for freedom and democracy and they would fight side by side with their white brothers and die side by side with the white brothers and then when they came back to the United States in places in the south they weren't allowed whereas before they were allowed to sleep in the same barracks and use the same latrines and eat in the same chow halls with their white counterparts in some places in the south they were still weren't allowed to go to movie theaters or go to restaurants um, go to the same schools as their white counterparts. So this, and then a lot of them were being disenfranchised uh, from voting. So the irony didn't escape Martin Luther King that here we were fighting for democracy and dying for democracy in someone else's country but when we came back to our own country some Americans didn't have the same rights. So you can tell this weighs on his mind and then he gets into this speech and I believe out of all these assassinations the key to figuring out why people did what they did to kill JFK to kill Martin Luther King to kill Robert Kennedy and to attempt to kill others is all based out of fear okay so I think it's the same group that killed JFK or elements of the same group that killed JFK also killed Martin Luther King and also killed Robert Kennedy and you have to look at the common theme between all of those and you, you find several themes here so in JFK he was trying to make peace with the Soviet Union. He didn't invade Vietnam, or excuse me, he didn't invade Cuba, and I think the Cuban Missile Crisis was the last straw for the main holdouts in the right-wing part of the government. That's when they all decided that Kennedy had to go. And so, same thing with this speech, that same group of right-wing, and see, when, when you talk about conspiracies and assassinations you don't have to involve everyone and you don't have to say oh it's the entire government and you don't have to distrust the entire government it's only certain key people at certain junctures that can enable a conspiracy to occur and as with JFK MLK and RFK they were all extreme right wing elements mostly southern elements in the um, 
key positions in the government, the FBI, the Secret Service, um, the State Department, even in the White House, um, the CIA, the military. You don't need a lot of, you don't need everyone involved. You can have people that do things that further the conspiracy along and protect it that don't know they're involved in a conspiracy. Okay? And so the same the same elements in the government, the right wing extremist extreme anti communist elements in the government, almost the exact same things we see nowadays, except for some reason that element is turned pro Russian, I which it's really bizarre to me. But um Mostly Southern. Texas had a lot of power. Georgia had a lot of power. A lot of people don't realize, okay, that until the 1970s, Georgia was the second, I think, ahead of Florida. Like the second, had the most, the, the second highest electoral votes after Texas in the South. So there was like New York and Illinois and Pennsylvania. And then there was California, and then there was Texas and Georgia. So this is one of the reasons why Sam Rayburn was head in the Congress and the Senate um, from Georgia of the Defense Committee. Georgia has always been their senators, Sam Nunn. Um, most of the senators have been very powerful influences from Georgia for the military industrial complex. You see a lot of military bases in Georgia. You see Columbia, uh, I think it's changed now, but it there's a base now down, uh, down near Columbus. Um, when I was in Atlanta, there was Fort Gillum, there was Fort McPherson, there's a Naval Air Station there. Um, there's a base, Fort Gordon, out near Augusta. There's Fort Stewart. Um, there's a Moody Air Force Base. Uh, there's a Marine Logistics Base. There's Kingsland uh, Naval Base where they have Trident submarines. Um, Georgia has an extraordinary hold on the military, and therefore a lot of the people that were involved were from Georgia. Um, other groups involved, of course, was the Mafia. The CIA used the Mafia as hitmen, an organization, you know, organizers, cleanup men. They did that with Oswald, and you can see some of the elements involved in the MLK assassination with uh, Sirhan Sirhan. Sirhan Sirhan got a job as a jockey, even though he wasn't even qualified, at the Los Alamitos. Um, Racetrack, which is owned by Sam Giancana. And FBI Director Hoover got in debt and got, you know, did a lot of horse uh, track racing out there, and all the way up to when he retired. And so you see the mafia involved in that. Um, there's racist elements of uh, white supremacists like jowl and uh, other things involved um, let's see there is uh, James Earl Ray got a passport a Canadian passport uh, from a guy that was in formerly involved with the uh, CIA uh, or connected to the CIA out of Montreal I believe and so you've got this loser from Oklahoma petty thief somehow is able to change his identity, get plastic surgery, um, get these fake passports, and not get caught for several months. And how does he do that? This is just a petty thief, okay? Anyway, so there's that element involved, and then you see the same kind of... What they do is they pick these loser patsies, okay, that are not too smart, like, you know, Oswald, James Earl Ray, um, and then Sirhan Sirhan, and they set them up to take the fall for these assassinations. So, but anyway, I believe that it was right-wing elements of 
the industrial military industrial intelligence complex in the United States um, racist elements that were against civil rights mafia elements okay and uh, that's mainly the, the, the three main groups there now I don't see any Cuban influence in this one but it doesn't mean there weren't Cubans around because this guy Raul who was with James O'Reilly might have been Cuban I'm not sure anyway we've got some documents we're gonna go over we're gonna go over this speech but I I want you to get the flavor because I think what what was happening is as long as Martin Luther King stuck with the civil rights movement it pissed off the the racists and the Ku Klux Klan but they didn't have any power to change things okay not a lot once he turned against the Vietnam War and there was the prospect that the military was going to lose I mean all Martin Luther King had to say after this speech was that he was against the war and he didn't think it was right for any African American to be involved in the war and to therefore resist the draft go to jail they'd already seen he'd been able to mobilize people to go to jail for civil rights and now he now it was just all of a matter of Martin Luther King saying okay that's it we're going to jail we're gonna resist the draft that sent Johnson and his other military guys involved in Vietnam into a panic because if you lose 30 it is it was hard enough to get enough people to go to Vietnam but you end up losing 30 percent of your of your fighting force and then you're fighting a domestic war against resistors all this kind of thing going on because there are people that wouldn't just be pacifists also like like Martin Luther King there would be people that would take Martin Luther King's resistance to the war as a signal to fight against the war to fight the establishment there were already people doing that you know the weather underground all things like that and would take it to a violent extreme also the Martin Luther King was planning this people's march against poverty in DC and there were already protests that were happening in DC but Martin Luther King could bring to bear a couple of million people to the steps of the Pentagon and the White House in DC and their plan basically was to set up shop to camp there and to petition Congress to end the war and to further poverty programs and things like that and to stay there until those things got accomplished but if they turned their focus against the war it would have been a real big problem so this is one of the reasons they wanted to get rid of I believe Martin Luther King I, I think especially after the Tet Offensive and they saw the public reaction even though we won the Tet Offensive for months you know the president had been telling the American people that the war was almost over we were around we we're, were coming around the bend the fighting was going to be over within six months and then the Tet Offensive hits and it showed to the American people even though we won the Tet Offensive that the Vietnamese weren't broken and what was happening in Vietnam is that most people weren't communist but they were anti-foreigner, anti-colonialists. They wanted to get the white faces, the white bodies, out of Vietnam and ha have control of their own country. And so they were wanting to do that so bad, they were willing to, to side with any group that was fighting because they just threw out the French 10 years before and now they've got these Americans coming in. So they were willing to most... Vietnamese weren't communists were willing to sign up with anybody fighting against the foreigners and that just happened to be the communists so that's what happened they just wanted to get it was a nationalist revolution basically armed by the communists 
um, the right wing, the, the fervent anti-communist Johnson couldn't see the difference, okay, and just assumed it was another communist takeover of Vietnam. Now we see the results, what, 50 years later? Vietnam is still communist. They're anti-Chinese communists. But also they have one of the fastest growing economies in the world because they've accepted free enterprise. So it's kind of a mixed bag there. But I think that if we had not gotten involved in Vietnam like we did and allowed them to control their own destiny, things would have ended up a lot different. You'll also hear Martin Luther King talk about Ho Chi Minh even though Ho Chi Minh was a, a fervent communist, you know, he was the leader of their country there. Anyway, so I think this is the speech that got Martin Luther King killed. Uh, we're going to go through it. And this speech happens in the fall. The Tet Offensive happens in February to March. At the end of March right after the Tet Offensive, four days before Martin Luther King is killed, Johnson resigns or says he won't run again. Martin Luther King is killed four days later, and then two months later, almost exactly to the day, another opponent of the war, Robert Kennedy, the brother of the slain former president, he gets killed. So what happens why would people result to assassinations they only do these things because they're desperate they the military industrial right wing complex in the country saw felt because of the war protest MLK came out against the war RFK came out against the war they thought they were losing their grip and a lot of them thought that this was a communist inspired or communist funded um, counter revolution insurrection against the government a lot of them seriously thought that instead of what the reality was is it was a domestic insurrection against the war anyway I've rambled on too much here but let's get into this speech we'll go through it and then I'm going to get into some documents here. All right. Dr. Cominger and Rabbi Heschel, some of the distinguished leaders and personalities of our nation. And of course, it's always good to come back to Riverside Church. Over the last eight years, I I've had the privilege of preaching here almost every year in that period. It is always a rich and rewarding experience to come to this great church and this great program. I come to this magnificent house of worship tonight because my conscience leaves me no other choice. I join you in this meeting because I am in deepest agreement with the aims and work of the organization which has brought us together, clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam. The recent statements of your executive committee are the sentiments of my own heart I found myself in full accord when I read its opening lines. A time comes when silence is betrayal. That time has come for us in relation to Vietnam. The truth of these words is beyond doubt, but the mission to which they call us is a most difficult one. <clears throat> Even when pressed by the demands of inner truth, 
Men do not easily assume the task of opposing their government's policy, especially in time of war. Nor does the human spirit move without great difficulty against all the apathy of conformist thought within one's own bosom and in the surrounding world. Moreover, when the issues at hand seem as perplexing as they often do in the case of this dreadful conflict, we are always on the verge of being mesmerized by uncertainty. But we must move on. Some of us who have already begun to break the silence of the night have found that the calling to speak is often a vocation of agony. But we must speak. We must speak with all the humility that is appropriate to our limited vision. But we must speak. And we must rejoice as well for surely this is the first time in our nation's history that a significant number of its religious leaders have chosen to move beyond the prophesying of smooth patriotism to the high grounds of a firm descent based upon the mandates of conscience and the reading of history. Perhaps a new spirit is rising among us. If it is let us trace its movements and pray that our own inner being may be sensitive to its guidance. For we are deeply in need of a new way beyond the darkness that seems so close around. Over the past two years, as I have moved to break the betrayal of my own silences and to speak from the burnings of my own heart, as I have called for radical departures from the destruction of Vietnam, many persons have questioned me about the wisdom of my path. At the heart of their concerns, this query has often loomed large and loud. Why are you speaking about the war, Dr. King? Why are you joining the voices of dissent? Peace and civil rights don't mix, they say. Aren't you hurting the cause of your people, they ask. And with, when I hear them, though I often understand the source of their concern, I am nevertheless greatly sad. For such questions mean that the inquirers have not really known me, my commitment or my calling. Indeed, their questions suggest that they do not know the world in which they live. In the light of such tragic misunderstanding, I deem it of signal importance to try to state clearly, and I trust concisely, why I believe that the path from Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, the church in Montgomery, Alabama, where I began my pastorate, leads clearly to this sanctuary tonight. I come to this platform tonight to make a passionate plea to my beloved nation. This speech is not addressed to Hanoi or to the National Liberation Front. It is not addressed to China or to Russia. Nor is it an attempt to overlook the ambiguity of the total situation and the need for a collective solution to the tragedy of Vietnam. Neither is it an attempt to make North Vietnam or the National Liberation Front paragons of virtue, nor to overlook the role they must play in the successful resolution of the problem. While they both may have justifiable reasons to be suspicious of the good faith of the United States, life and history give eloquent testimony to the fact Conflicts are never resolved without trustful give and take on both sides. Tonight, however, I wish not to speak with Hanoi and the National Liberation Front, but rather to my fellow Americans. Since I am a preacher by calling, 
I suppose it is not surprising that I have seven major reasons for bringing Vietnam into the field of my moral vision. That is, at the outset, a very obvious and almost facile connection between the war in Vietnam and the struggle I and others have been waging in America. A few years ago, there was a shining moment in that struggle. It seemed as if there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white, through the poverty program. There were experiments, hopes, new beginnings. Then came the build-up in Vietnam, and I watched this program broken and eviscerated, as if it were some idle political plaything of a society gone mad on war. And I knew that America would never invest the necessary funds or energies in rehabilitation of its poor, so long as adventures like Vietnam continue to draw men and skills and money like some demonic destructive suction tube. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor and to attack it as such. Perhaps a more tragic recognition of reality took place and it became clear to me that the war was doing far more than devastating the hopes of the poor at home. It was sending their sons and their brothers and their husbands to fight and to die in extraordinarily high proportions relative to the rest of the population. We were taking the black young men who had been crippled by our society and sending them 8,000 miles to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia which they had not found in southwest Georgia and East Holland. So we have been repeatedly faced with the cruel iron, watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same schools. So we watch them in brutal solidarity burning the huts of a poor village, but we realized that they would hardly live on the same block in Chicago. I could not be silent in the face of such cruel manipulation of the poor. My third reason moves to an even deeper level of awareness, for it grows out of my experience in the ghettos of the North over the last three years, especially the last three summers. As I have walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men, I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. But they ask, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They asked if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problem, to bring about the changes it wanted. Their questions hit home, and I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghetto without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. For the sake of those boys, for the sake of this government, for the sake of the hundreds of thousands trembling under our violence, I cannot be silent. For those who ask the question, are you a civil rights leader? And thereby mean to exclude me from the movement for peace. I have this further answer. In 1957, when a group of us formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, we chose as our motto to save the soul of America. We were convinced that we could not limit our vision to certain rights for black people, but instead affirmed the conviction that America would never be free or saved from itself until the descendants of its slaves were loose completely 
from the shackles they still wear. In a way, we were agreeing with Langston Hughes, that black bar of Holland, who had written earlier, oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath, America will be. Now it should be incandescently clear that no one who has any concern for the integrity and life of America today can ignore the present war. If America's soul becomes totally poisoned, part of the autopsy must read Vietnam. It can never be saved so long as it destroys the deepest hopes of men the world over. So it is that those of us who are yet determined that America will be are allowed, are led down the path of protest and dissent, working for the health of our land. As if the weight of such a commitment to the life and health of America were not enough, another burden of responsibility was placed upon me in 1954. And I cannot forget that the Nobel Peace Prize was also a commission, a commission to work harder than I had ever worked before for the Brotherhood of Man. This is a calling that takes me beyond national allegiances. But even if it were not present, I would yet have to live with the meaning of my commitment to the ministry of Jesus Christ. To me, the relationship of this ministry to the making of peace is so obvious that I sometimes marvel at those who ask me why I'm speaking against Could it be that they do not know that the good news was meant for all men, for communists and capitalists, for that children and ours, for black and for white, for revolutionary and conservative? Have they forgotten that my ministry is in obedience to the one who loved his enemies so fully that he died for them? What then can I say to the Viet Cong? Out to Castro, out to Mao, as a faithful minister of this one, and I threatened them with death, or must I not share with them my life? Finally, as I try to explain to you and for myself the road that leads from Montgomery to this place, I would have offered all that was most valid if I simply said that I must be true to my conviction. But I share with all men the calling to be a son of the living God. Beyond the calling of race, a nation, a creed, is this vocation of sonship and brotherhood. Because I believe that the Father is deeply concerned, especially for his suffering and helpless and outcast children. I come tonight to speak for them. This I believe to be the privilege and the burden of all of us who deem ourselves bound by allegiances and loyalties which are broader and deeper than nationalism and which go beyond our nation's self-defined goals and positions. We are called to speak for the weak, for the voiceless, for the victims of our nation, for those it calls enemy, for no document from human hands and make these humans any less our brothers. And as I ponder the madness of Vietnam, and such within myself for ways to understand that not of the ideologies of the Liberation Front, not of the hunter inside gone, but simply of the people who have been living under the curse of war for almost three continuous decades now, I think of them too, because it is clear to me that there will be no meaningful solution there until some attempt is made to know them and hear their broken cries. They must see Americans as strange liberators. Vietnamese people proclaimed their own independence in 1954, uh, in 1945, brother after a combined French and Japanese occupation. 
and before the communist revolution in China. They were led by Ho Chi Minh. Even though they quoted the American Declaration of Independence in their own document of freedom, we refused to recognize them. Instead, we decided to support France in its reconquest of a former colony. Our government felt then that the Vietnamese people were not ready for independence. We again felt... Oh, I want to make a comment about that. A lot of people don't know that even though it was American, excuse me, French bodies, soldiers in Vietnam that tried to retake their colony from when the Japanese left, they were supplied by the Americans. So all the equipment that the French use came from the Americans. And a lot of the financing came from America because France was bankrupt after the war. They didn't have any money. But anyway, that's another thing there. No victim to the deadly Western arrogance that has poisoned the international atmosphere for so long. That tragic decision, we rejected a revolutionary government seeking self-determination. And a government that had been established not by China, for whom the Vietnamese have no great love, but by clearly indigenous forces that included some communists. For the peasants, this new government meant real land reform, one of the most important needs in their lives. Nine years following 1945, we denied the people of Vietnam the right of independence. For nine years, we vigorously supported the French in their abortive effort to recolonize Vietnam. Before the end of the war, we were meeting 80% of the French war cost. Even before the French were defeated at Dien Bien Phu, they began to despair of their reckless action, but we did not. We encouraged them with our huge financial and military supplies to continue the war even after they had moved. Soon we would be paying almost the full cost of this tragic attempt at recolonization. After the French were defeated, it looked as if independence and land reform would come again through the Geneva Agreement. Then instead there came the United States, determined that whole should not unify the temporarily divided nation. The peasants watched again as we supported one of the most vicious modern dictators, our chosen man, Premier Diem. The peasants watched and cringed as Diem ruthlessly rooted out all opposition supported their extortionist landlords and refused even to discuss reunification with the North. Peasants watched. Another thing also is that Dem was a Catholic and that the majority of the Vietnamese were uh, Buddhists and he basically uh, set up his whole government full of Catholics. The military leaders were mostly Catholics and uh, ruthlessly um, persecuted the, uh, the Buddhists, the Buddhist monks, burning their temples, seizing their property, things like that. And uh, of course, that didn't endear us to that because, you know, when we support a dictator, people don't look and say, oh, well, that's just a dictator and that's wrong, but America is okay. No, what they do is they look at America and they say, oh, what a bunch of hypocrites and liars. They say they support democracy, but if you look around the world, we're supporting every two-bit dictator as long as he says he's not a communist. We're giving them weapons, training their, training their uh, police forces and military, and then having them go around the world you know, and oppress the people. You know, and this is the hypocrisy of America, is that we have these great ideals, the great, you know, constitutional ideals, but the reality, like slavery, even though we had supposedly democracy and 
elections and constitution, we still enslaved a third of our population. And then, even after the Civil War, and supposedly uh, the freedom for the African Americans, they were still oppressed through the Jim Crow laws. And then we were, went around the world bombing people for democracy. You know, I don't see how you can bomb a country. We dropped more, I think Martin Luther King even says it, we dropped more bombs on Vietnam than we did in all of Europe during World War II and Japan. I mean, like, even Kennedy says this, uh, RFK said this before he was killed. I mean, what else are you going to bomb? You, you, you can't bomb a country into loving you. You can't bomb a country into getting on your side. And, matter of fact, if you go over Vietnam today, especially North Vietnam, on Google Maps, you'll see craters from the bombs that we dropped. So, again, it's this ironic, I, I put it mostly to the southern um, ultra-right-wing ultra, ultra right wing conservatives, that it's democracy, like exactly like they're doing now, it's democracy for white people, and everyone else, you know, below that. That's what, and they're enforcing that with their weapons, I mean, look at the U.S. military, and, you know, think about how many, I love America, don't, don't take this wrong, but we have to seriously look at ourselves and see us for the way we really are, not the way we ideally believe we are. And think about it, as bad as some of these countries like Vietnam and China and, this, and Russia and these two-bit dictatorships in South America and Africa are, you know, Ecuador didn't drop a nuclear bomb on any country. Zaire didn't drop a, didn't bomb the shit out of the Congo. Or maybe they're the same. No, out of, uh, let's say South Vietnam, South Africa didn't bomb the shit out of Mozambique. Okay? Even the Soviet Union, with all its nuclear weapons, hasn't dropped a nuclear weapon on any country. They bombed, what, Afghanistan? I'm trying to think where, where else did they bomb. But if you look at where China and Russia have bombed compared to what the United States has bombed, we blow them away, literally. And I'm not saying I'd rather take American bomb or Russian Chinese bombs over, or their former government over America, but we seriously have to question why are we doing those types of things if we say we believe in democracy and the Constitution and human rights and all these things. So, in a sense, America is schizophrenic. We have a mental illness, and we have a dual personality, where on one hand, we're the most generous nation in the world, with nobody, you know, when there's a tsunami or volcano going off somewhere, or there's refugees in Africa, nobody lends a hand like America does. When there's a conflict and people need to be rescued, nobody lends a hand like America does. You don't see Russian troops going into Kurdistan to help the Kurds and rescue them from Saddam Hussein or things like that. You don't see the Chinese going into Indonesia and helping them after a tsunami. You don't see, you know, Canada or Brazil going into Europe after World War II with their own Marshall Plan to keep people from starving to death after World War II. But you see America doing that, and that's the good thing. There's the good things about American democracy. People 
love it so much they will fight and die to get here. But again, like I said, we're schizophrenic. There's this duality. We have freedom, freedom of the press and a constitution, but we have more people in prison than any other nation in the world. We have more police shootings than any other nation in the world. We have more mass shootings than any other nation in the world. So we're schizophrenic. We have a mental illness that on one hand, one of our personalities thinks we're all normal and sane. And then on the other hand, the rest of the world sees us as a bunch of psychopaths, murderous, barbarous psychopaths. And how do we go forward as a nation with a dual personality like that? I don't know. You know, we have this great thing about democracy, but then on the other hand, we murder people we don't agree with. We killed off, you know, JFK. We assassinated Martin Luther King. We assassinated Robert Kennedy. We, we, we had people try to kill Ford, try to kill McGovern, and try to kill Reagan. And often the same people that are the assassins are the ones that saying they're standing up for democracy. So, also we have some of the highest incidents of mental illness in the world. Nobody takes more psychotropic, mind-controlling, mind-altering drugs more than the Americans. Nobody. So... I guess what I'm saying is that we're mentally ill, but I don't really know what the cure is, but just to talk about it and to expose it, you know, because if someone's mentally ill, there's enough, you can't stop them unless you legally can find them to a mental institution. They're going to be the way they are until they die. The same thing with America. We're going to be this schizophrenic, dual personality type country, kind of a yin yang, love and hate kind of country until the day we're destroyed. And maybe this goes back to our days as, you know, as, um, you know, a lot of us are brought over as prisoners as uh, Irish prisoners on the British prison boats. And we had indentured servants, and then a lot of us were brought over as slaves. And a lot of us couldn't fit in because our views were either too extreme or religious ideas were too extreme for the rest of Europe that they either kicked us out or we fled. So we're descendants of people that are on the edges, that are living on the edges, and, you know, maybe even a little eccentric, a little mentally ill. So maybe that's how we got here. And maybe that's the way it would always be. I don't know. Anyway, so we're going to um, move on here. And I wanted to say one more thing about that. I mean, you can go into any city in the United States, any city, and again, it's that duality, that that schizophrenic type of situation where we have extreme wealth, you know, some of the nicest, biggest, fanciest hotels, buildings, stadiums, ballparks, mansions in the world. And right next to that we have tons of homeless people living on the streets in poverty and, in, and drugged out. And then we have people that are working that are living in poverty. That are working. 
It's not that like they're lazy. So there's this extreme duality in our schizophrenic type of reality that we call America. And I don't know what the solution would be for that, but anyway. All right, so I read some of this last time, but I'm not sure I started off, so I'll just start over again. It says the assassination of Martin Luther King. Uh, Martin Luther King, an African-American clergyman and civil rights leader, was fatally shot at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee, on April 4th, 1968, at 6 p.m., um, Central Standard Time. He said he was rushed to St. Joseph Hospital where he died at 7.05 p.m. He was a prominent leader of the Civil Rights Movement and the Nobel Peace Prize laureate who was known for his use of nonviolence and civil disobedience. James Earl Ray, a fugitive from the Missouri State Penitentiary, was arrested on June 8, um, 1968 at London's Heathrow Airport, extradited to the United States and charged with the crime on March 10th, 1969. He pled guilty and was sentenced to 99 years in the Tennessee State Penitentiary. He later made many attempts to withdraw his guilty plea and be tried by a jury, but was unsuccessful. Ray died in prison in 1998. So again, not another trial. They didn't try Oswald because he was assassinated. They didn't try um, James Earl Ray because he confessed, supposedly, or pled guilty, and then he withdrew it. Anyway, let's see. The King family and others believe the assassination was the result of conspiracy involving the U.S. government, the Mafia, the Memphis police and alleged and alleged as alleged by Lloyd Jowers. In 1993 they believed the Ray was a scapegoat. In 1999 the family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Jowers for the sum of ten million dollars. During closing arguments their attorney asked the jury to award damages of a hundred dollars to make the point that it was not about the money. And I'm a little confused about this jury because it's my understanding it wasn't a real jury like in a criminal court or civil court. It was a um, composed jury. Basically, they got people um, just to come in and be on the jury, and they had a judge that they rented, and... Uh, I guess they presented their case. I'm not sure if there was someone for the state um, to present their case. And maybe I think uh, Jowers had an attorney, uh, and then Pepper presented the case against Jowers, and they won. But it wasn't like a criminal court, or it wasn't a it wasn't a civil court. It was a, a made-up jury, which I, I don't know how you can legally do something like that, but um, so when they mentioned that it was, they won a case, it really wasn't a legal case in the legal sense, but we'll find out more about that later. All right, so let's see, it says, the allegations and finding of the Memphis jury were later disputed by the United States Department of Justice in 2000 due to the received lack of evidence. The assassination was one of four major assassinations of the 1960s in the United States, covering several years after the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1963 and the assassination of Malcolm X in 1965, and two months before the assassination of Robert Kennedy in 1968. It says, as early as the mid-1950s, King had received death threats because of his prominence in the civil rights movement, he had confronted the risk of death, including a near-fatal stabbing in 1958, and made its recognition part of his philosophy. And matter of fact, the the day before, um, 
he was assassinated, he gave a speech, and in the speech about that, he was talking about a letter he received from a girl, and they, that she had heard that the blade that went into his heart in 1958 was so close that if he had sneezed, it would have killed him. And in the letter, she, he mentions that in the letter, she says that she's glad that he didn't sneeze. Now, another thing about this is the very next year, his brother, Martin Luther King's brother, we'll go over this, was actually found dead in a swimming pool in Atlanta. He had drowned, supposedly. There was a lot of uh, suspicious things about that. And then in the 1970s, about, what, 1976, 77, 78, his mother was killed by some, of course, mentally ill guy. Um, I'm not sure exactly why he, he killed her, but he shot her and shot, I think, the organist there at the church. So a lot of strange things happened there. Anyway, um, let's see. Memphis. King traveled to the Memphis Tennessee in support of a striking American... Um, sanitation workers, the workers had staged a walkout on 11 February 1968 to protest unequal wages and working conditions imposed by Mayor Henry Loeb. So basically, they had African Americans that would go into the African American community and pick up the trash, just like the white guys that would go into the white community and pick up the trash. But the African American workers were making like a third or half of what the white guys were making. And of course the mayor tried to say, well, because the white guys had seniority and the blacks were new, newly hired and stuff like that, and that's why they weren't working as much. But, you know, that was one of the things that uh, Martin Luther King went there to protest about, the unequal wages. All right. It says... Uh, there were no city-issued uniforms, no restrooms, no recognized union, and no grievance procedure for uh, numerous occasions of which they were under underpaid. During Loeb's tenure as mayor, conditions did not significantly improve. The gruesome February 1968 deaths of two workers in a garbage compacting truck turned mounting tensions in, into a strike. King participated in a massive march in Memphis on March 28, 1968, which ended in violence. On April 3rd, King returned to Memphis to attempt a successful new march later that week. His airline flight to Memphis was delayed by a bomb threat, but he arrived in time to make a planned speech to gather at the Mason Temple, world headquarters of the Church of God in Christ. At the Mason Temple, Kennedy, uh, excuse me, King delivered his famous I've been to the mountaintop speech. Now, I did that in the first video. In it, he recalled the 1958 attempted assassination, noting that the doctor who treated him had said because the knife used to stab him was so close to his aorta, any sudden movement, even a sneeze, might have killed him. He referred to a letter written by, this is what I was talking about earlier, written by a young girl who told him he was happy that he had not sneezed. He used the reference to say, I too am happy that I didn't sneeze. Because if I'd sneeze, I wouldn't be around here in 1960 when students from all the South were started sitting on lunch counters. If I'd sneeze, I wouldn't be around here in 1961 when we decided to take a ride for freedom and end segregation in interstate travel. King repeated the phrase, if I'd sneeze, several more times recalling numerous other events and acts of civil disobedience from the previous several, uh, several years, the Al Albany Movement, 1962, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963, and the Selma to Montgomery March in 1965. As he neared the close, he prophetically referred to the bomb threat. And then I got to Memphis, and some, some began to say the threats. We're talking about threats that were out. That were out. 
what would happen to me uh, from some of our sick white brothers? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it doesn't matter for me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind like anybody I would like to live a long life longevity has its place but I'm not concerned about that now I just want to do God's will and he's allowed me to go up to the mountain and I've looked over and I've seen the, the promised land and I may not get there with you but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land and so I'm happy tonight I'm not worried about anything I'm not fearing any man excuse me my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord Sorry, I don't do that paragraph in my rendition any any justice. Martin Luther King. <clears throat> Martin Luther King will always own that speech. Anyway, let's move on, and um, we'll get back to this at another time. All right, so these are uh, Freedom of Information requests for files that the FBI had on Martin Luther King. Now, a lot of these files, they burnt. You know, um, when you're doing illegal things, you're not going to keep that to, uh, get, you know, be given out and later on to prove that you've been doing illegal things. So they burned those. A lot of these illegal things that Hoover, who's... A racist and completely against the civil rights movement against Martin Luther King. I mean, literally, they didn't have one black FBI agent until like the late 60s, okay? So, anyway, um, we'll just read through these. These are not all going to be about the assassination. A lot of these are going to be about, I've never, I haven't even read into these yet, so I'm, I don't know what we're going to find. But, um, probably going to find some stuff about them monitoring his um, civil rights movement, what he was doing. Now, Hoover was very adamantly determined that Martin Luther King was being funded by the, the Russians, the Soviets, and it was a communist front. The whole civil rights movement was just used to agitate, was just a Russian communist front to cause agitation in the United States, and that's the way he saw it. He didn't see it that for what it really was. Okay, again, this goes to this mental illness, especially among the right wing, that they don't see things the way they really are. That's all covered in their point of view from the mental illness in their political point of view, the way they see things, instead of seeing it the way it really is. Now, this is a memo. I, I'm not, I haven't read through any of this, so this is going to be brand new. So this is to the director from Michael Sheehan, Council, Office of Professional Responsibility, um, January 19. So this would have been during the um, House Assassinations Committee investigations. They were investigating the JFK assassination and they did a little bit about the Martin Luther King assassination. So they're probably requesting records in this letter here. Excise report on FBI's Martin Luther King investigation. Attached is a copy of the excise version of the report of the office's Martin Luther King task force. Excise were made to protect the privacy rights of persons to protect sensitive FBI sources and methods and to delete classified material. In addition, and again, you got to wonder what kind of classified information would be involved in the assassination of Martin Luther King. You know, just like 
with Oswald. Why is Oswald's tax returns still classified because of national security after 60 years? What kind of national security information would be in Oswald's tax returns? Would it be that maybe he was getting monthly payments for, as an FBI informant? Could it also be that some of the people um, that were involved in the assassination of Martin Luther King were FBI informants? So that's the number one rule in the government back then and now is CYA, cover your own ass, okay? Or CYOA, excuse me, cover your own ass. And the way the government does this is making everything classified and redacted or burning, just burning documents. And again, like I've said about the JFK, MLK, and RFK, it's not like the conspirators are going to get together and create a memo and say, yeah, remember when so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so got together on this date at this place and we conspired to kill JFK, MLK, and RFK? And here's the document showing that, and da-da-da-da-da. All that's going to be word of mouth, okay? There are not going to be any documents of them confessing to that. And any documents that do even hint about that, they got lots of paper shredders, and there's a reason they have paper shredders and paper burners in, in the FBI, in the CIA, and even in the military, okay? Because they're, you know, they burn, what, the Secret Service burnt all the uh, Secret Service logs when they were requested by the House Committee about Trump. So they did the same thing with JFK. Oh, oops, we, we burnt those in routine uh, destruction. Bullshit. I'd say total bullshit. Anyway... No decision has been made on whether this report will be released to the public. And again, you got to wonder if you've got elected officials on taxpayer salaries doing an investigation paid for by the taxpayer involving the investigation of a citizen of the United States who was assassinated, that why wouldn't all, all of that information be released to the public? Anyway. All right. I, I like to look at the handwritten notes because these are always interesting. So it says, 31 January 1977, Director, Federal Bureau of Investigation from Michael Sheehan, Jr., Counsel, Office of Professional Responsibility, excise report on the FBI's Martin Luther King investigation. Okay, this is the same one here. Department of Justice. Don't you just love that? Report of the Department of Justice Task Force to review the Mar FBI Martin Luther King Jr. Security and Assassination Investigations, 11 January 1977. Ah, so they did a whole report. All right. So this is the Department of Justice, which is the director has been appointed by Carter, and so they did up their own report and gave it to the committee. The mission of the task force, the problem. On November 1, 1977, William Sullivan, former assistant director, Domestic Intelligence Division, FBI, testified before the Senate Select Committee to study governmental operations with respect to the intelligence activities. He related that from late 1963 and continuing till assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., King was the target of an intensive campaign of FBI to neutralize him as an effective civil rights leader. And of course, William Sullivan should know because he was the one that was directing the campaign against, against Martin Luther King. Sullivan stated that in the war against King, no holds were barred. So you got to figure you got a civil rights leader who's trying to get civil rights for minorities in the United States, and why would an arm a 
law enforcement arm of the federal government be having a no-holds-bar war against Martin Luther King. Anyway, keep going. Senate report number 94-755, final report on the select committee to study governmental operations with respect to intelligence activities, book 2, page 11. This and other testimony describing the FBI counterintelligence campaign against King reached the public through the news media. So, from 63 to 68, they've got a no-holds-bar war against MLK, but yet in 68, they were allowed to investigate the assassination of the person they were having a no-holds-bar war against. It's sort of like allowing the thief or the fox into the chicken house, right? This and other testimony described the FBI counterintelligence campaign against King reached the public through the news media. As a consequence, there was a regeneration of the widespread speculation um, of the possibility that the Bureau may have had some responsibility in Dr. King's death and may not have done an impartial and thorough investigation of the assassination. You think? The Attorney General's directive. Now, look, hear me out, folks. When I say that elements, right-wing elements of the FBI were involved with the assassination of JFK, MLK, and RFK, it doesn't mean that your average FBI agent in a field office in Chicago or New York or Atlanta was involved in the assassination. There's thousands of FBI agents, and I'm sure they're nice guys. But you don't need a lot of people to do things. You also have a culture in the FBI at that time with Hoover of basically doing whatever the boss wanted to do, no matter what you personally felt about it. If you wanted to keep your job in move up in the ranks you did what the boss said to you for you to do or if you didn't you would end up in no man's land in some field office in Pierre North Dakota investigating cattle mutilations or some shit like that so it's a yes man mentality just like with Hitler and Caesar You've got people that are willing to do whatever the boss says so they can keep their job because they got pensions, they got mortgage, they got kids in college, they got the wife running up the gold card, and they got to make that payment. So basically, it's do or die because what else are you going to do as an ex FBI agent? Go start a business somewhere? Anyway. On November 24, 1975, the Atlanta Attorney General of the United States directed the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department to undertake a review of the files of the department and its Federal Bureau of Investigation to determine whether the investigation of the assassination of Dartmouth Martin King should be reopened. More particularly, it was sought to be determined whether any action taken in relation to the Dr. Martin Luther King by the FBI before the assassination had or may have had an effect or direct or indirect on the event. Again, if you're going to be involved in illegal activities in your official part of the government, you're not going to always use openly the government apparatus to achieve those illegal goals because that can always be traced back to you. That's why you're always going to use, you know, some too big hood like James Earl Ray or Sirhan Sirhan who you can control and have deniability and you're going to use that through three or four layers okay so an FBI guy is going to have an, a contact in the mafia the mafia is going to have some street level thugs they're going to run around with some hypnotist or some psychiatrist or doctor that's going to be treating Sirhan Sirhan, where Sirhan Sirhan doesn't even know it's the mob, doesn't even know that it traces back to Hoover. Okay? 
All Sirhan Sirhan knows is that he fell off his horse and injured his head, and now he's got to go to these doctors, and when he goes to the doctor, he's out for 30 minutes or an hour and wakes up later and doesn't remember exactly what happened. Same thing is with James Earl Ray. James Earl Ray was in Los Angeles seeing a doctor there also, a hypnotist, okay? And he would have these spells but he would be out for an hour and then he'd wake up and he didn't remember what happened. So it's deniability, okay? And you always want to get some crazy guy because you can always blow it off like, you know, John Hinckley. Oh, he's just some crazy guy. He didn't know what he was doing. He has no connection with anyone in the government, okay? Deniability. So when they go down this road, they're not going to find anything because there's no official paperwork. Sirhan Sirhan's not getting a check from the FBI, okay? There's no handwritten note from Hoover to Sirhan Sirhan or James Earl Ray, okay? That's the way these things work, deniability. Whether any action was taken by the FBI, which had or may have had um, any other adverse effect on Dr. King. Recommendations for criminal, disciplinary, and or appropriate action were requested. The review up to 26 April 1976. For the next four months, the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Civil Rights Division, his principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General, and the chief of the criminal section of the Civil Rights Division, acting as review staff, variously read portions of the FBI headquarters file on the person. So let me explain to you how this works, okay? So you've got the acting attorney general, the deputy attorney general, and maybe the assistant deputy attorney general. They're all appointed by President Carter. They may be good men, they may be self, you know, righteous men looking to do the right thing, okay? But they don't know the landscape. Probably some of them were doctors or lawyers or friends of Jimmy Carter that know nothing about the Justice Department and how it works. They wouldn't even know where to find a file if you sat it right there in front of them, okay? So they depend on bureaucrats, bureaucrats that have worked their way up through the system for 10, 15, 20 years. A lot of these bureaucrats, idealistic bureaucrats from the Kennedy era, quit. They dumped. They jumped ship. When Johnson came on board. And even more jumped ship when Nixon came on board. And even more jumped ship when Ford came on board. So what you're left with is hardcore right wing outlook. Republican or Southern Democrat people in the bureaucracy. Okay? And you got the same thing in the FBI. So when the Justice Department head, the Attorney General puts out a memo and says, hey, give me everything you got on the FBI. And if they tried it to thwart MLK or if they were part of the assassination, guess what, folks? He's not going to find anything, okay? Because the people that know where all the bodies are hidden are not going to give them up, okay? They're just not simply going to do it. They know there's an election every four years, and they know they've got a pension, and they know there's going to be someone else, hopefully Reagan or another Nixon, coming in four years. All they got to do is stall the guy give them a few names, a few papers, but don't give them the beef, okay? That's how these things work. And then the Justice Department will write a nice little memo and hand it over to the um, committee that's requesting that information, say, no, well, we, we purged our files, we looked, we requested information, but we didn't find anything showing that the FBI was guilty. <laughs> you see how that works? They're not going to find anything. 
unless a team of people go in there with warrants to the Justice Department and the FBI and arrest everyone and take them out of the building and they're able to get to the files before they get destroyed and they know where to look because you got thousands of files of cabinets and basements and warehouses it could be in warehouses anywhere they're not going to find anything okay so it's sort of like it's sort of like you know go and ask Whitey Bur Bur Burger in prison did you kill anybody and he says no I didn't kill anybody and then going back and and telling the judge, well, Whitey Berger said he didn't kill anybody. Okay, that's fine. Here, well, we'll, we'll release him because he said he was, he's not guilty. You don't think the FBI, people that have committed crimes, that have pensions and mortgages and kids in college and boat payments and summer homes in Florida, are going to admit that they participated in killing Martin Luther King, JFK, or RFK, or there may be people that didn't participate but found out about it later. They're not going to risk their careers by saying, hey, hey, look what I found, and be a, a Boy Scout. They're going to keep their head down low. That's the way it works in the government. Keep your mouth shut. Keep your powder dry until you can survive and get that pension and retire. Which I believe in the FBI is like age 50. So they're not going to give it up. And anything that does come out won't be coming from the FBI or the Department of Justice. Anyway, so this is almost laughable. They go through this whole charade of formality of, oh, We'll send a letter to the Justice Department. We'll send a letter to the FBI and see if they have anything saying that they were, you know, involved in the assassination. Oh, you weren't involved? You sent us a letter back saying you, you checked and you weren't involved? Oh, okay, that's fine. Well, we'll just on to the next thing. It's folly. It's, it's a joke. Okay? This is why the, no one got convicted, no one got arrested. Okay? All right. And besides, they've already covered it up. They've already, you know, four or five extensions out. So that shows that they're not connected to James Earl Ray or Sirhan Sirhan. All right. So we'll keep going. Actually, no, i got to stop here. Um, so let me mark this. This is page 12. All right. So we're going to keep doing this. Videos, Wikipedia. Um. FBI files, there's only about, uh, what is that, about 200 pages of FBI files on the Martin Luther King assassination they have on their vault, which is very interesting because they've got two or 3,000 pages on Rodney King, <laughs> you know, and they've got 500 to 1,000 pages on sightings of Hitler in South America after World War II. And they've got 1,000, 2,000 pages of reports on UFOs, but they've only got 300, 400 pages on the Martin Luther King assassination. So that tells you something. A lot of burning of papers started occurring after 1968 and especially coming up to 1975. Shredders were working overtime every night. Okay? Anyway, so we'll pick this up later on.